In this module, we are going to learn uh, about two applications of perturbation theory of degenerate states uh, in atomic systems, well atomic and molecular systems. But before that, let us just remember where we had stopped in the last module, we developed this first order perturbation theory for degenerate states. We understood that for degenerate states where you have n number of wave functions associated with the same unperturbed energy where the size denote complete set of orthonormal functions, you cannot write the perturbed energies as perturbed wave functions uh, as psi 0 plus something. First of all you need a linear combination because you do not know which of these functions is going to contribute in uh, which perturbed wave function they are all identical indistinguishable. So, uh, well functional forms may be different, but indistinguishable in the sense that energy is same. So, there is no way in which we can say that one particular wave function will contribute and the others will not, okay. cannot do that. So, this is what it is, we write the wave function, we start with a linear combination of wave function, then go to the usual definition of our uh, corrected wave function, usual definition of uncorrected energy of corrected energy and then uh, we arrive at this matrix equation in which we see perturbation V i j operates on these eigen vectors to give the uh, E k first order energies as the diagonal elements of this matrix capital X. This is something I think I forgot to say earlier, this capital X is the matrix of uh, first order corrections to energies. And here the beauty is uh, you can see from this uh, expression here that all the no off diagonal elements are going to be 0, delta ij remember. So, we are going to have this diagonal matrix where the diagonal elements are only going to be uh, non-zero and they are going to give you the values of first order corrections to energies. So, we start from here. The first system that we discuss is that of a non-rigid rotor. And there the perturbation that we have to consider is centrifugal distortion. We have already studied at length this unperturbed system of rigid rotors and the assumption there was that the molecule is like a rod, it does not change bond length in the course of rotation or the bond length is equal to the equilibrium bond length. In a non-rigid rotor what happens is uh, the bond is flexible it is not like a rod. So, what happens if you take a spring, tie some weight at the end and rotate it? The spring is going to get elongated, right? So, uh, we are still working within right now, uh, we have not said whether bond of Neimer approximation is valid or not, we are sort of working within it. We are not considering vibration and rotation uh, simultaneously as such, but we are considering the effect of vibration that the average value of R0 square, which is the all important term in the uh, rigid rotor Hamiltonian that average value of R0 square is going to increase. Okay. So, we start with the unperturbed system rigid rotor for that the Hamiltonian as we know is L square by 2i when L square by 2i operates on psi j0 we get B j into j plus 1 I was thinking that I am making some mistake somewhere and I have actually written it a little later also sorry about that. Of course, I think you can see that this equation is not complete, you must write the wave function also 0 order uh, psi j, okay. this is what we have learnt and uh, e j 0 will be equal to then b into j into j plus 1 just this nothing. So, perturbation is centrifugal distortion as we said somehow it came and vanished is not it. From classical mechanics we know that the centrifugal distortion 
is associated with a potential that is proportional to the fourth order of angular momentum. So, we construct the operator v equal to k minus k n to the power 4. Now, please remember here we are going to use it what l to the power 4 means. So, l square psi is equal to say something what do I write? Let me write a psi. So, now if l square operates on this function, this is a function right? l square operates on l square psi, what do I get? l square operating on a psi, a will come out and l square operating on psi will give me, uh, we had said a earlier, so I get a square psi, right? Of course, you have done this in your uh, tutorials and all. Left hand side will be l to the power 4 operating on psi. So, this is the meaning of l to the power 4, l square has to operate twice that is all. Uh, but of course, you know it in case there is a confusion in anybody's mind, I thought I will just say it once. Okay. So, this is your centrifugal distortion. So, centrifugal distortion when it operates on the wave function and remember we will still work with the uncorrected 0 th order wave function. There is no need to incorporate the correction term as we have learned a few modules ago. We get minus k l to the power 4 operating on psi j 0 th. Now, remembering that l square by 2i operating on psi j 0 th gives me b j into j plus 1, I can rewrite that and I can get l square operates on the uncorrected wave function to give me 2i multiplied by b multiplied by j into j plus 1 multiplied by psi j 0 th. Now, what do I have to do to get uh, this Eigen value of l to the power 4? I have to make another l square operate here. So, when I do that what do I get? 2 i b these are all constants they come out j into j plus 1 constant come out. So, I am left with uh, all these constants multiplied by l square operating on psi j 0 th and I know that is going to give me well it is going to give me 2 i b j into j plus 1 multiplied by psi j 0 th simple right. So, we make this operation and we get v operating on psi j 0 th is equal to minus k l to the power 4 operating on psi j 0 th gives us minus 4 k i square b square j square into j plus 1 whole square psi j 0 th. Please do not square psi the wave function. Okay, You need to understand how the operation is done I am sure uh, you are clear with that. Okay. So, this is what I get, this is the Eigen value of this V operator. Okay. So, V operating on psi j 0 gives me in short we will write minus d into j square into j plus 1 whole square psi j 0 where d is equal to 4 k i square b square. Okay. Now, see let us work with this wave function. With, uh, with this level j equal to 1 which is triply degenerate. You can work with any level. In fact, I will encourage you to work with j equal to 2 or something and see for yourself what happens. I mean if you work with j equal to 0 that will be cheating because there is no question of degeneracy there. So, let us work with this j equal to 1 which is triply degenerate mj for that the magnetic quantum number equal is equal to minus 1 0 plus 1. So, the V matrix as we have discussed earlier is going to be something like this the matrix elements will be written V 1 1, V 1 2, V 1 3 and so on and so forth. Our job is to find the matrix elements. Well, now if you remember the linear equations that we had written earlier in order to get solutions there the secular determinant has to be 0. Uh, this is something that is very well known Kramer's rule we are going to use it and maybe I will discuss a little more about that when we talk about variation theorem. So, secular determinant has to be equal to 0 that means the determinant corresponding to this matrix should be equal to 0. So, dead V will be equal to 0 something like that right minus x. Okay. Now, see 
we will try to simplify these expressions for v11, v12 and so on and so forth. To do that we will remember that the psi j 0th is really an Eigen function of the operator phi and it has an Eigen value minus d into j square into j plus 1 whole square. So, with that let us begin. We will also remember that this v and h 0th actually uh, commute right it is apparent here they have this common set of wave functions. So, what is v i i? V i i will be integral psi i 0th v psi i 0th over all space. Do we have v i i here? Yeah, v 1 1, v 2 2, v 3 3. What is the value? I can write like this v operating on psi i 0th I know is minus d into j square into j plus 1 whole square all that is your uh, all that is uh, constant. So, we will come outside the integral inside the integral you have integral psi i 0th multiplied by psi i 0th well if it is complex then psi i 0th star multiplied by psi i 0th integrated over all space what is that? We know what that is is not it? We know that this is equal to 1 great. So, already we have simplified and we have found the expressions for v i i. So, the expression will be minus d into j square into j plus 1 whole square. So, you take this and v i j what is v i j? So, uh, basically we are going to replace this expression here, but before that let us think a little bit about v i j. V i j has two different wave functions integral psi i 0th whole psi i 0th star multiplied by v operating on psi j 0th integrated over all space. That will give me similarly d I have written j dash just to uh, signify that this i and j are different minus d j dash square multiplied by j dash plus 1 whole square multiplied by integral psi i 0th star psi j 0th overall space and we know very well that these wave functions are orthonormal. So, this is going to be equal to 0. So, what we are saying is that v i j is equal to 0. Now, when I say i and j um, what do I mean? It is very clear what I mean by v i i when I what do I mean when I say uh, i and j well not so difficult also I mean that we are talking about uh, two different uh, degenerate wave functions. Okay. So, that is equal to 0. So, now the secular determinant I just show you that once again. So, remember all these diagonal terms will become this minus d into j square into j plus 1 whole square minus x all of, of diagonal terms as we see here is going to become 0. So, this is the secular determinant that is equal to 0 very simple right take the determinant this multiplied by this multiplied by this equal to 0. Um, the expression that you get for x which is the first order correction to energy is minus d j square into j plus 1 whole square. Uh, it has 3 roots, but the 3 roots are identical is not it because what we have essentially is minus d into j square into j plus 1 whole square minus x whole square whole cube equal to 0. So, the roots are identical roots are the same and we have the same amount of correction to energy for centrifugal distortion no matter what uh, L value we have chosen well, no matter what uh, M value we have chosen rather. Okay. So, this is the expression that we get E j now instead of b j into j plus 1 becomes minus d becomes b j into j plus 1 minus d j square into j plus 1 whole square. So, this is a case where perturbation removes none of the degeneracies whatever degeneracy was there will remain right. We have started we have demonstrated this with this j equal to 1 state which is triply degenerate. So, what we see is that energies will go up, but a term in m is not coming in. Okay. So, all the three 
m sub levels have gone up by the uh, total energy by by the by the same amount the total energy has gone up by the same amount for all the three sub levels so this is an example of uh, perturbation theoretical treatment of degenerate systems where degeneracy is not lifted at all but don't think there's no effect the energy is changing energy of each j level is decreased by dj square into j plus 1 whole square okay so much for our non rigid rotor but now we want to discuss something in which uh, actually degeneracy is lifted and that example is provided by stark effect stark effect means lifting of degeneracy by electric field and we are going to learn stark, stark effect we are going to uh, go a little quickly through this because we have actually introduced all the necessary tools i really would like you to try it and do things yourself so let's talk about the uh, principal quantum number 2 for hydrogen atom now i hope the change in gear was not very quick we are talking about non rigid rotor so far now we are talking about stark effect in hydrogen atom okay n equal to 2 for n equal to 2 what are the orbitals the first wave function is 2s second one is 2p0 third one is 2p minus 1 fourth one is 2p plus 1 and once again even though it might have become a cliche please don't forget 2p minus 1 is neither 2px not 2pz not not 2py 2p plus 1 is neither 2px not 2py but rather a linear combination of them 2px and 2py are obtained by linear combinations of this 2p minus 1 and 2p1 as well 2pz is actually equal to 2p0 okay when m equal to 0 then we actually get the pz orbital uh, we have discussed this in significant detail while talking about orbitals okay so v in this case is minus equal to r where e is the electric field and uh, we can write it as minus epsilon r cos theta because uh, it's uh, it can be at an angle right so that we can write as minus epsilon into z where epsilon is the magnitude of the electric field now this is a secular determinant that is equal to 0 here it's important to remember what v1 2 v2 1 3 and all that is here we are designating 2s as 1 so v11 would be the perturbation term involving 2s orbital and 2s orbital same with v22 v33 v v44 fine what about v12 it involves 2s orbital and 2p0 orbital what is v13 it involves 2s orbital and your uh, 2p minus 1 orbital and so on and so forth all right now as usual first let us write down the wave function actually i should have written the theta phi part here as well but anyway to start with theta is fine so this is the theta part of the wave function as you know and now i don't remember exactly if i have we did talk about recursion relations but i don't remember if i talked about this if not just take it axiomatically that uh, when you take A, what kind of polynomials are these? Like where? No, Legendre. So when a Legendre polynomial is multiplied by the coordinate, then you get a linear sum of the uh, polynomial before and polynomial after. I think we did it. Yes, recursion relation. We actually discussed it. Right. So here our variable is cos theta. So I have written cos theta multiplied by the uh, Legendre polynomial in cos theta. and here i have written l because i am talking about hydrogen atoms sometimes by mistake i might have written j please correct it when talking about hydrogen atoms so it's a linear sum of the polynomial in l minus 1 and polynomial in l plus 2 okay so now what is your vij vij is equal to minus epsilon r multiplied by pi cos theta cos theta pj cos theta integrated over all all function space okay here we have our good friend cos theta multiplied by pj of cos theta so of course you can expand using this recursion relation 
and you get minus epsilon r I hope I have not missed brackets here minus epsilon r no there is no question integral I can write P L of cos theta multiplied by A into P L minus 1 of cos theta plus B into P L plus 1 cos theta. Okay, so, naturally we get two terms and this gives me 0 right let us see. So, let us take these two what do I get? I get something like integral P L of cos theta we will start of that if it is uh, not real actually it is real here multiplied by P L minus 1 of cos theta and this gives you something similar this one is P L cos theta second one is P L plus 1 in cos theta. So, I get two integrals and now see uh, once again do not forget that these are wave functions right an orthonormal set. So, this integral P L in cos theta multiplied by P L minus 1 into cos theta integrated over all space that has to be equal to 0 yeah that must be equal to 0 because they are orthogonal to each other same here. So, finally, after all this you get the answer to be 0 v i j is equal to 0 unless your delta l equal to plus minus 1. What will happen if delta l is equal to plus minus 1? Delta l means the difference between i and j. If j equal to i plus 1 or if j equal to i minus 1 then one of these integrals is going to survive right. So, if only if delta l equal to plus minus 1 we are going to get uh, v i j non 0 otherwise in all other cases you are going to get uh, v i j equal to 0. Now, let us think v 1 1 that is 0 v 2 2 v 3 3 v 4 4 very easily they are all equal to 0 you do not have to worry much yeah because of course, delta l is not equal to plus minus 0 uh, sorry plus minus 1 it is plus minus 0. So, this v 1 1 v 2 2 v 3 3 v 4 4 are gone. What about v 1 2 for v 1 2 is delta l equal to 0 let us see. 1 means 2s, 2 means 2p0. So, of course, for this L equal to 0, for this L equal to is it 0? Is it 1? Is it 1? Yeah? Yes, it is 1. Delta L is equal to 1. M here is 0, not L. Okay? Please uh, do not get confused, even if I try to confuse you. So, so what we see is this 1 2 is going to be non 0 because delta L equal to plus minus 1. Similarly, uh, V 2 1 is also going to be non 0 because delta L equal to plus minus 1 right. In case I talk too much and confused you over the last 2 minutes let me just say it once. We have proven that V i j is equal to 0 unless delta l equal to plus minus 1 for v i i v 1 1 v 1 v 2 2 v 3 3 v 4 4 since delta l equal to 0 that is not plus minus 1 v i j so v i i is equal to 0 no problem v 1 2 and v 2 1 are non 0 because delta l equal to plus minus 1 ok here L is 0 here L is 1. In fact, um, since our time for this module is getting over I leave it to you to work out and prove that V 1 2 equal to V 2 1 is equal to 3 epsilon. 
remember what epsilon is this is epsilon magnitude of the electric field not very difficult to work out. So, we get this kind of an expression you just go back here what about V 2 3 V 2 3 means 2 p 0 and 2 p minus 1 for both L equal to 1. So, delta L is 0 again same with V 2 4 V 4 3 V 4 2 V 3 3 2 for all these delta L equal to 0. So, all these are equal to 0. So, uh, I have already told you what V 1 2 and V 2 1 are the 3 epsilon and I need to figure out what is V 1 3 V 1 4 V 3 1 V 4 1. For that well I have put the card before the horse and I have shown you the answer first. So, even these are equal to 0 why because now we need to worry about the non well we have to worry about the imaginary phi dependent part of the wave function also and it is not very difficult to see that this L z of which this capital phi is an Eigen function and minus epsilon z that is just z they are going to have common Eigen functions. So, by applying the logic that we have done already we can obtain we can establish that these are 0 and you can also figure out that x is equal to 0 0 plus 3 and minus 3 in terms of epsilon. Okay. So, now what has happened if x what is x x is the first order correction to energy. So, if that is equal to 0 that means there is no change in energy. So, what we see is that for these 4 orbitals s p 2 s 2 p 0 2 p minus 1 2 p plus 1 2 of them do not change in energy 1 is stabilized 1 is destabilized. Okay. Which one will be stabilized which one will be destabilized not very difficult to say that the one that is aligned with the electric field the uh, orbital whose angular momentum is aligned with the electric field will get stabilized the one for which it is not aligned with the electric field that will get destabilized. So, that has to be plus 1 and minus 1. Okay. So, let me just draw a schematic diagram I request you to have a look at Pillar's book for a more detailed level diagram here I am just going to uh, draw a little sketchy sketch if I may call it that. Uh, here we had these 4 orbitals 2 s 2 p 0 2 p minus 1 2 p plus 1. Out of these 2 are stabilized and destabilized and I have told you that 1 has uh, one of them is 2 p plus 1 one of them is 2 p minus 1 I have told you the direction of angular momentum with respect to the electric field. Now, I would like you to it is very simple figure out whether plus 1 is stabilized or minus 1 very easy you would, most of you would have got the answer by the time you finish the question, but please do it sometimes it is better to ask oneself easy questions also. Now, what I want to draw your attention to is that 2 orbitals do not change in energy. So, out of these 2 which is s and which is p 2 s and 2 p 0 they do not change energy right for them your uh, x is equal to 0. So, here can I say that this one is 2 s and that one is 2 p how will I do it because again energy is the same. So, I cannot do it. So, here I have to take linear combination. So, I have to take something like C 1 would have written uh, I will call it maybe C and T and not even write 1. So, I can write C psi 2 0 th plus D psi 1 0 there is no reason for writing 2 before 1, but then it does not really matter. So, these are actually linear combinations of this 2 s and the 2 p 0 orbitals. Okay. Uh, 
how to find the coefficients all that is easy. And suppose uh, what I am saying is not even right. Suppose they are s orbital and p orbital they do not combine. Even then this is fine because in that case one of the coefficients will be equal to 0. So, this is general expression and here now for the first time we have encountered the mixing of orbitals right. When we write linear combination what we are doing essentially is that we are saying that the orbitals have mixed. So, when orbitals mixed mix you get what are called hybrid orbitals. You are familiar with hybrid orbitals we talked about we have learned earlier about hybrid orbitals in valence bond theory. So, here what are we doing we are mixing 2s and 2p0 we are getting hybrid orbitals okay. and in this case the two hybrid orbitals are the same energy right. And we have discussed a situation in which perturbation removes some of the degeneracies not all, not all, not none, some this plus 1 and minus 1 have get very different energies well get different energies and the uh, 2s and 2p0 these orbitals mix and the energy is not changed. That leads us to the concept of hybrid orbitals. This is the uh, discussion of perturbation theory that I wanted to perform. So, the stage is set to go and talk about go back to our multi electron atoms if I only want to talk about perturbation theory, but there is another method that we want to learn and that is variation method that is what we will do and then we will see how variation method and perturbation method both can be used to take us back to multi electron atoms and then we will discuss uh, a little further. So, as you see uh, 41 lectures I think are over it is supposed to be a 60 to 70 lecture course. So, about two third of the course is over and uh, we are nowhere near molecules that is because the tools that we develop while learning multi electron atoms are very very useful when you want to talk about molecular systems. We do want to talk about approximation methods that are typical of molecular systems as well like Huckel method, but those are easy. These uh, are more fundamental more interesting and requires a little more attention that is why we are spending so much of time on learning these techniques. And before ending the module let me also say this it is impossible to understand this unless you go back and work out everything by yourself. Also you should refer to books see I am typing all this uh, on the slides uh, it is human to err. So, it is very possible that there will be error in the slides that I might not notice. So, it is important that you also read the book books also have typos, but well to a lesser extent perhaps or maybe mine is a lesser extent. So, please do read the books that we have referred to and please do write it out it is important to write out these things then only you will understand. Okay. So, I trust that you will be able to do that and uh, next time we are going to talk about variation methods. Thank you.